Hi, this is Dr. Doug Willen reporting from Brooklyn today. This is where I live in my apartment, but I practice as a chiropractor in Manhattan, uh, just a few miles away. I uh, ride a bicycle to work in the morning. I'm not working today. I will be going into the office for a few hours tomorrow, tomorrow to see some emergency cases. But other than that, I'm pretty much shut down and in my apartment. Big plan today would be to go for a bicycle ride for about an hour just to get some exercise. But other than that, I'm staying in probably a lot like you are. I wanted to talk today about the term triage. And it's a very emotional topic. It's one of the toughest things we're facing, uh, at least the, the medical professionals are facing with COVID-19. Um, so, Flipping to the next thing, it's one of the hardest questions doctors face, who, who, who will be saved and who won't? Uh, this is a headline from the New York Times. I also have, to give credit, also have some Los Angeles Times um, excerpts. So, as the coronavirus infections explode in the U.S., hospitals could be forced to make harrowing choices if pushed to the brink. So, this is what we're going to talk about, but before we go that far. I just want to show you a little bit of stuff in the news. Italian hospitals are overwhelmed by deaths amid coronavirus outbreaks. So we know that Italy and Spain have a huge surge of deaths due to COVID-19 in the last week, last two weeks. And the United States is catching up on their heels as far as um, fatal cases and serious cases, as well as uh, infections. You'll see in a second we're in the top position of countries with most infected cases. We moved ahead of China about five days ago, and we are well established as the number one country or the country with the most infections. But in this picture, you could see, um, you know, they're, they're overwhelmed. And this is what it's gonna look like everywhere, most likely uh, if we follow some of the same statistical uh, and epidemiology, epidemiological patterns and, and the statistics. So people are set up on little cots waiting for hopefully a doctor to stop by and attend to them. Uh, this is a picture from a Haitian hospital uh, taken recently um, that I found through Sky News, but you could see uh, overwhelm, overwhelm. And that's where the word triage comes in. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. Let me just give you a couple of stats. As of this morning, March 30th, uh, worldwide, there's 739,371 reported uh, cases or infective cases, and we're up at 35,000 deaths. Now, in the past seven days, we uh, doubled in deaths. And in the past seven days, we increased 360,000 cases worldwide. Uh, so this is not slowing down. We're still... Uh, still surging like crazy. So this is uh, one of the stats, um, charts that I use. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna try to drag this over here where we can use this little pointer. But the top uh, part of the chart says world, and this uh, says 739,000 cases. I think I had a more recent update. New cases since yesterday is 17,012. New deaths, 35,000. Oh no, this is total deaths, with new deaths being 1,050. Let's go down to the United States. The United States, among countries, has the most reported cases, 142,000. I think that number is going to even jump up higher because uh, we're just starting to get in the swing of testing now. Um, new cases, total deaths, and here, Italy, 97,000 cases, but total deaths they're just um, being overwhelmed with fatal cases. Spain has surging upwards. They have 7,000 total deaths. And just in the past 24 hours, 537. So we didn't have stats from Italy, so that's why it's not in there. Let's swing all the way over to this last column, deaths per 1 million population. In the USA, we're at eight deaths per 1 million total population in the country. Look at Italy, 178 people have died per 1 million population. And Spain is 157. And those numbers just have uh, gone up exponentially even in the last few days. 
So um, hopping over to where I live in New York, this is New York State, not New York City, but it's 59,000 total cases, of which most of them are in New York City. New cases since yesterday is 6,200, and new deaths since yesterday is 82. So we're, I'm uh, in the new epicenter, being in New York, and uh, but we're still surging, uh, graphically speaking, behind Italy, and we'll see what the next week or two brings. I wanted to spend some time on this term triage. Um, the definition is the assignment of degrees of urgency to wounds or illnesses in order to decide the order of treatment of a large number of patients or casualties. Now, you've probably all watched some of the TV dramas where maybe there is a, a fire or some type of catastrophe or earthquake or flood and all the uh, ambulances arrive at first the closest hospital, but then that hospital is overwhelmed and then the other hospitals in the city start taking the next round of casualties or uh, people rushing to the emergency room. And quickly an emergency room can be overwhelmed and the word triage comes it's really an older term, and I'm going to show you that in a second in history, but it's about making decisions. And I remember when I first really learned about the term in my medical training at chiropractic school, um, it was a little confusing to me because my thought would be that you would give medical treatment to the person, let's say, bleeding the most. So let's say someone has a horrible gunshot wound and they're bleeding profusely. Let's say there was a type of terrorist attack. And the person next to them had a gunshot wound, but maybe to the shoulder. The medical professional would have to make a quick decision. I can't work on both people. So I have to start to sort out who to work on first. And they literally might make the profusely bleeding person go without care if they feel that their outcome is very slim, whether they give care to that person or not. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a second, but let's go back and just take a peek. So the term uh, uh, triage has been around for a long time. And as you could see in the top uh, of that photo, the word triage is up there. So that's a triage station. And that's what we're seeing with COVID-19. Uh, hospitals will have a tent out front and they will start to sort people as they arrive. Are they mild cases, severe cases? Do they need to go to intensive care immediately? And if you don't have enough beds, you don't have enough ventilators, you don't ha have enough staff, who gets treated first and who doesn't get treated? It is a moral and ethical dilemma. Let me, uh, I lost my spot there, so sorry about that. Um, so here we go, I'm back on track, thank you for waiting. So again, the word triage is the process of determining the priority of patients' treatments based on severity of their condition. But here's the cool, the not cool thing. Here's the interesting point. It's also the likelihood of recovery with, with or without treatment. So it's a way this rations patients treatment efficiently when resources are insufficient. So when you don't have medical supplies, you don't have bandages, you don't have ventilators, how do you decide who gets treated next. And um, the term comes from the French word, and I'm sure I'm gonna ruin this so you can make fun of me in the comments, trier, meaning to separate, sort, shift, or select. And think about that as we go forward. Um, the modern medical triage was invented by Dominique Jean Larey, a surgeon during the Napoleonic Wars, so that's how far back it goes, who treated the wounded according to the observe gravity, the, the severity of their injuries and the urgency for medical care. Because out in the field during the war, you have to quickly decide who's going to live, who's going to die, and who will die anyway, whether you work on them for three or four hours or not. Um, it was further developed or used during World War I and, and so on. And there's, uh, it's interesting reading if you want to dig in. But here's, here's the sorting process. Number one, those who are likely to live regardless of what care they receive. So if we're talking about COVID-19, someone comes in with a mild fever 
and a little bit of a cough, a little bit of shortness of breath. They're young. They look healthy physically in so many ways. So that person might be thought of as a mild case and they might not get any treatment for a while. They might be told, well, go sit down for a few hours because we're overwhelmed right now. We have too many people to look at first. And you would think, why are you helping them? But we can't help everybody. So we have to make choices. And the sorting process would say that that's a mild case. We're not going to give them any care right now. Go sit down for a few hours. Look at number two. Those who are unlikely to live regardless of what care they receive. With COVID-19, we know that people in their late 80s have a, a lower chance of living. Um, if people have a cardiovascular disease or diabetes, they might have a lower chance of living. So right now, hopefully in most medical facilities, hospitals, we're able to treat everybody that walks in, but there could be a time in the next week, two weeks, or Italy and Spain are already experiencing this, where a medical doctor has to make a decision whether to treat an 85 year old with diabetes and cardiovascular disease, give that ventilator to that person or give it to someone that might survive. Because the thought is if you give it to that 85 year old with pre-existing condition like diabetes or heart disease, and they're on the ventilator for five or six days, but there's a high likelihood they're going to die anyway, why give the last ventilator to them? Or even worse, what if someone of that age group was on the ventilator and tomorrow we have 50 new people arrive with serious COVID-19 infection? Some of them will definitely survive, or not definitely, but highly likelihood of survival if they were on the ventilator for a few days and responding to secondary infections like pneumonia through antibiotic care and stuff like that. Do you take those senior citizens off the ventilator and move them over to someone else. These are horrible ethical decisions, but that's the time that we're living in. We're in an overwhelmed place. Let's look at the last one. Those for whom immediate care might make a positive difference in outcome. And that's what triage is all about. So I'm so thankful I, I'm not in that position. I'm not that type of uh, healthcare doctor, but there are doctors in the trenches all over the world right now. They've been doing that in China for a couple of months. They're doing that today in Spain and Italy. They're starting to do that in New York City here while we're waiting for more supplies, more ventilators, uh, more equipment, more staff. And someone has to make those horrible, horrible decisions. Um, so there's different levels of triage. So simple triage. Simple triage is usually used in a scene of an accident. So like I said, and we've seen that in movies, there's an earthquake, there's a fire, there's a terrorist attack, there's the bombing of the embassy, something like that, that we see in TV shows. And, um, and they happen in real life, of course, but I'm just saying we've, we've seen that dramatized. And quickly the medical staff has to sort out who goes to the emergency room, who gets immediate surgery, who gets a tourniquet, who gets band-aids or antibiotics or who gets shipped to a different hospital. And this can be started before transportation becomes available. So it could be right at the scene of the bombed out place in the movie and the medical staff runs over and starts to sort people. So sorting is triage. Sorting, selection, discernment, and selection. Advanced triage. This is where it gets horrible. In advanced triage, specially trained doctors, nurses, paramedics may decide that some seriously injured people should not receive advanced care because they are unlikely to survive. And the loved ones are standing by going, can't you do something? Work on this person, work on my loved one. And the trained, specially trained doctors and staff might say, no, let me move on to someone that I might be able to save or that I have a exceedingly high percentage chance of saving. And that's advanced triage. The use of advanced triage may become necessary when medical professionals decide that the medical resources available are not sufficient to treat all the people who need help. And that's what's happening with supplies, as we've talked about, you see in the news. But down in the trenches, that's what they're experiencing. This has happened in disasters such as, like I said, terrorist attacks, mass shootings, volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, tornadoes, thunderstorms, and 
pandemics. In those extreme situations, any medical care given to people who will die anyway can be considered to be care withdrawn from others who might have survived. So let me say that again. So what's considered by these advanced trained medical personnel is that if we give that ventilator, if we if we all take two or three people to pounce on that person that's probably not going to live anyway, we're literally taking care from the person that might have had a chance to live given that medical equipment or medical team crash unit coming down and helping them. Crazy, crazy times. Um, Madrid, there's a little piece I saw here in the New York Times. Um, in one of Madrid's biggest hospitals, um, one of their medical doctors, Daniel Bernabeu, signed the death certificate of one patient. So he's standing over here signing one death certificate on a gurney and immediately rushes over to have to save someone who is choking because of clogged lungs from the COVID-19. So this is in the waiting room. This is not even getting in. So this is the type of things that our medical professionals are facing now. Also things like morgues. Uh, hospitals don't have enough room for people that are dying at this rate, so they move up refrigerator trucks to the side of the hospital to temporarily uh, put people in there. Um, intensive care wards. Uh, a lot of the seniors uh, might not have a chance if we don't catch up to the overwhelm that's happening because... Um, the doctors have to make that decision who will be saved and who won't. Um, this ethical dilemma that critical care doctors, nurses, medical officials is happening worldwide. And I think we'll see it more before it lightens up. I mean, think about this. Okay, so if two patients have equal medical need and likelihood of recovering, do they pick the youngest? So is that is it that simple? So you have a 25-year-old uh, and you have a 55-year-old and they both have about the same history and the same chance of recovering, but there's one ventilator. Do you just give it to the youngest? Or, you know, maybe the 55-year-old is supporting a family of four. Maybe the 55-year-old is a healthcare worker, like a medical doctor that might go on to save more people. So this is where the the ethical debate comes in. Um, in Italy, these decisions where more than 3,400 have died as critical ill patients cram into hospital corridors and doctors turn their operating rooms into makeshift ICUs. They don't have enough ventilators to deal with the influx of patients. Doctors are denying service to the elderly in favor of young, and they're making these type of decisions. The U.S. has fewer than 100,000 intensive care beds, but it will probably need a total of 200,000 in a moderate outbreak, but 2.9 million if the outbreak is similar to what we had in 1918 with the Spanish flu. 2.9 million intensive care beds if it went that far. But still, we'd have to double our intensive care beds. And that came out of John Hopkins University. Um, some clinicians already are recommending denying critical care to anyone over the age of 85. So an 85-year-old grandparent gets taken to any hospital in the United States here. There's talk about not even admitting them. Just go home. And we're talking about that person with high fever, choked up lungs, difficulty breathing, can't get an airfall. They won't even be admitted. This has not happened yet, but it's being discussed because they want to leave those ventilators open for people that have a higher likelihood of survival. That's what triage is. That's the whole mess of triage. You know, this type of moral and ethical dilemma, there's three patients, a 16 year old boy with diabetes. So that's a pre-existing condition. A 25 year old mother, you know, she's got kids and a 75 year old grandfather. They're all waiting in the hospital triage tent and struggling to breathe. There's only one ventilator left. Who would you give it to? Let me know in the comments. Who would you give it to? What if you were the, you know, and there's arguments because it's always deeper than that. Who's the 75 year old? 
who's the 16 year old boy? Who's the 25 year old mother? Now the 16 year old boy might not have a good chance because they already have full blown diabetes. The 25 year old mother might sound like the best, right? She's got a kid at home. We don't know those circumstances. What if the 75 year old grandfather um, was a war veteran? Uh, let's say they were a medical army surgeon and saved thousands of lives throughout their life. I mean, why not save that person? Do you see there's, there's no right answer? And that's why it's so upsetting. And this is what is already happening. This is uh, people waiting in the hallways. There's not even rooms to put them in and not a ventilator to put this person on, perhaps. So um, it's a very emotional topic. There's no right answer. It's just what is. And um, I'd like to clear up the concept, so I hope this helped a little bit. I know sometimes I get some comments that I don't go deep enough, so I hope this was a little deeper and a little more informative, but also just to get you thinking and have such respect for the heroes out there that are in the trenches working with uh, this pandemic. Thank you.